I just I really enjoy the specific type of drive that the really early bluegrass bands had, like before it was probably categorized as bluegrass. That's the way I feel like I would want to feel the music. I, I kind of overexpose myself to, to that flavor of, of bluegrass just so I can learn to emulate it. Hey folks, Keith Billick here. Thank you so much for joining me for this beginning of the end of summer episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. You know, I'm, I'm sad for summer to be almost over, but this time of year is is not only great up here in Michigan, but it's also the time of year where I get to go to two of my personal favorite events. The first one is the IBMA annual World of Bluegrass event. That's the last week of September down in Raleigh, North Carolina. I will be down there along with my good pal Daniel Patrick from the Mandolins and Beer podcast. We will have an exhibit booth uh, during the business conference and also during the Fan Fest. So if you find yourself down there at the IBMA conference, please swing by the Picky Fingers slash Mandolins and Beer booth and say hey to me or if you want to talk some mandolins, I'm sure Daniel will be happy to indulge with that. I'll have t-shirts, stickers, hopefully doing some interviews and uh, hopefully playing some music as well. So it's always a great time. The second such event is the Great Lakes Music Camp up here on the shores of Lake Michigan. I will be teaching banjo alongside Gina Furtado, Trey Wellington, and Joe Newberry, as well as an all-star instrumental cast for all the other instruments. It's always a fantastic time. And I, uh, I am certainly not worthy of being included in that group but I'll do my best and I look forward to having a great time there. So that's at greatlakesmusic.org if you wanna check out the Great Lakes Music Camp. Let's talk now for a few minutes about the Patreon supporters of the show. Anyone who's listened to this podcast before knows about the deep love and appreciation that I have for the Patreon subscribers. Uh, you can become a subscriber yourself by going to patreon.com slash banjo podcast. And today we have a featured supporter of the show, and that is Brian Rosen. Brian's been playing music all his life, but only recently switched to banjo during the uh, COVID lockdown and has been absorbing it in any way he can from taking lessons locally with Craig Korth, who is a Canadian banjo superstar. And fun fact, the first time that I ever got to play a pre-war flathead banjo, it was because of Craig Korth's generosity handing me his own personal instrument to try out, and I still appreciate that. And of course, greatly appreciate the generosity of, once again, Brian Rosen for becoming the Patreon supporter of the show. And a reminder, patreon.com slash banjo podcast is how you do that. I do have one other message. I was checking my inbox on the Patreon site, and there are a lot of unclaimed free t-shirts out there for people who signed up on Patreon and didn't respond with their choice of size and color for the shirts. So if you are out there thinking that I have scammed you and owe you a t-shirt, chances are you just missed a message from me. So please go check your Patreon inbox and respond and I will get you your much deserved t-shirt as soon as possible. Today's featured guest is Trevor Holder. Trevor is the banjoist for the Price Sisters for the last year and a half, as well as a few other side projects. In fact, that sound clip that you are hearing right now is off of his brand newly released album titled Chattanooga Dogs, and that's a collaboration recording with Trevor Holder and Connor Vlietstra. Now, Trevor is definitely one of the younger guests that I've had on the podcast, but I think he might be one of the older souls that I've had on the show. And by that, I mean he tends to really dig in backwards in time to find those early roots of bluegrass and 
really pre-bluegrass banjo players. So I think you will hear all about his appreciation for that style of music and how he tries to emulate it the best he can. He is very steeped in the Don Reno style, and it was a thrill to catch up with him at this year's Dell Fest. So if you hear some commotion in the background, that's just uh, that's just the Dell Fest vibes happening. So please put your hands together and make welcome to the show, Trevor Holder. I grew up in Ringgold, Georgia, which is right south of Chattanooga, Tennessee, across the line. And it's kind of hard for me to kind of pin down exactly when I started being interested in the banjo. I guess my dad always listened to like Bill Monroe and Flat and Scruggs and stuff like that. Yeah. So I always kind of was had a familiarity with it. But I guess when I was like 12 years old, I, I saved up my money to buy like the cheapest like Guitar Center like banjo okay. to start learning on and then kind of took it from there. <laughs> so you, you had it in your ear. When did it become an interest of something that you thought you wanted to pursue for yourself? Well, after after about six months of just kind of learning a little, like from books and stuff, and that I made a little bit of progress doing that, but I didn't feel like I was getting to. I started taking lessons for. I took lessons. I can't remember for how long, but maybe like a year or two mm-hmm. from a guy in Ringgold uh, named Jim Panky. Um, oh sure, which, yeah, because he was he was right there in North Georgia. Oh, too. that's great. So uh, I really liked what he was able to instill in me. Like a lot of banjo pe- teachers might you know, like teach you just songs and tunes and just be like, this is how you play Cripple Creek and not go beyond that. But he was kind of really good at teaching me how to learn on my own. Oh, so I would that, love to hear more about that. What, yeah. uh, like what kind of things would that be? Yeah, so he would, he would be kind of, he would like take me through a song and then kind of explain not just like what the notes he was playing, like, like if it was an Earl Scruggs song or something, that he would be like, and this is probably like why he decided to like put these roles here and that this and play this lick here and once he broke it down like that and like actually took me through songs that way it became much easier for me to just go listen to a recording and learn it which i think Hmm. is what makes him such a good teacher is he kind of sets people up to learn whatever they feel like learning right yeah and you were able to get analog lessons from him rather than the the, the youtube (laughs) versions which i think everyone else is yeah he's he's gotten since then has gotten pretty popular this was i think before his like youtube fame like struck it (laughs) But uh, I, I think that's probably why I got so popular on YouTube, too, is he, he kind of brings a good teaching element to it. That I, yeah, so, I, absolutely. Yeah, I'm ha- happy to see him, you know, getting, like, some notoriety from that. Yeah, hard, hard to do that any other way when you're from probably, like, a small North Georgia yeah. town. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's so not too many in-person lessons uh, in that area, <laughs> probably. Can you by any chance think of, like, an example of, of an Earl Lick or, or just any Lick where maybe he would have taught you how to interpret it rather than just memorize the yeah, notes. Yeah, so I guess like um, like the Foggy Mountain Breakdown like kind of thing. Sure. Going back and thinking on it now, it seems like it's an obvious thing to a musician, but when you're first learning it, it's like totally not. It just seems like a sequence of random notes. Right. Me, but it's like, <laughs> well, it's like really easy to just like, there's Foggy Mountain Breakdown and like... Like Lonesome Road Blues or something like that, mm-hmm. and you know, e- even just like those little bits and pieces that he would break it down like that. I think at such an early phase in like my development as a musician, kind of really helped me piece everything together. So like he he would teach me that, and like like I'd learn Cripple Creek, the and like when I would go learn like the next song, maybe he taught me like the ballad of Jay Clampett or something. It's like the same. He would relate it back to like remember going like. It's like, right, you know, that right, kind of right. Thing. And he was really good at, at like circling back to stuff like that and just relating it to a few roles and like maybe little licks that I had already known and kind of just, and then like even if I had to learn something new, he'd be like, well, it, yeah, like this lick it was just like, you know, the other one you know, but you just change these few things. It seems like it's a lot less intimidating it, it is. when you it, already it, kind of know yeah, half it, of it. It made it familiar. For me, yeah. like the whole time, and it was really easy. He's really good at breaking things up in something that I could practice and then have down in a week, mm. as, as well. I think he was he had that skill of just being like, 
this is about what you'll be able to figure out in a week. And then I go home and practice it and have it by the next week. And it's like, all right, and then go from there. I did that weekly, you know, for, for a little while, which was yeah. super helpful for me. I probably wouldn't have ever, you know, actually gotten gotten much progress with the banjo if it wasn't for that kind of push that he was giving me. Now that you mention it, that's I think that's a really great point because I've done some teaching myself and mm-hmm. some things that you try to introduce maybe are too much for for new students to bite off and, and you don't want to set them up for coming back to each lesson and be like, okay, that's better, but you still got to just keep working yeah, on I've, it. The, that's the, sort of defeating. The few <laughs> lessons that I've given, I, I, I kind of feel bad because sometimes I feel like I'm not good at that at all and I'll just like be like, <laughs> Here's the entirety of Cripple Creek <laughs> like on your right. first lesson. Then they come back, and obviously, like the, in a week, like a beginner's not just going to come back like ripping Cripple Creek yeah, for you. Yeah. So I, I don't really know how to like cycle back and be like, well, no, this is this is Cripple Creek <laughs> yeah. or something. I don't know, but yeah, some people know. got it, and I, apparently Jim yeah. is one of them. That's yeah, cool. No, it's not so. So who who do you think you were? Uh, influenced by like you've said Scruggs a few times you said Panky was mm-hmm. taking you through that and you said your folks were were playing some of that but um, yeah was that um, your main thing probably for not that long but probably for a little while it was when I first first starting I you know loved Earl Scruggs and like just the, like the Martha White show stuff or just like uh-huh. watching that it was it's kind of like a the stereotypical just like oh I heard Foggy Mountain Breakdown and I wanted to like I wanted to learn that one and stuff like that right you already had those DVDs at the time uh, or, or YouTube, probably. Oh, did they? Okay. <laughs> but that, that was the big thing with, with Jim is like him teaching me how to learn on my own. I was able to draw up influences from whoever I felt like it because of that, like the kind of skill that he had taught me so early on. So maybe like eight months to a year into me playing, I was just doing Scrug stuff. And then I went to like my first Fiddler's convention. And there was a guy there who... Um, introduced me to like Don Reno kind of stuff hmm. and I went home and I'm still on Don Reno stuff like yeah. for, for the that's that's my he's probably my favorite banjo player at like out of genre and and everything just you know obviously incredibly creative but also mm-hmm. just like you know his feel and, and like kind of bounce that he had I really enjoy <laughs> For, for bluegrass stuff, that's been my main, like, Don Reno and, like, maybe prominent, not prominent bluegrass banjo players from the 50s, like uh, Alan Shelton mm-hmm. or Larry Richardson or Don Stover, people hmm. people like that. I just, I really enjoy the the feeling and specific type of drive that that the really early bluegrass bands had, like, before it was probably categorized as bluegrass. Interesting. But that kind of thing, kind of, that that's that's the way I feel like I would want to feel the music. So, yeah, yeah. I, I would love to talk more about that. You said the the specific kind of drive they had. How do you have a way of describing that, or like how would you, yeah. if you're in a band, how would you construct that? Yeah, it's it's weird because it's such a like an abstract concept. Right. Of, yeah, because it's not just drive. I feel like that's easier to talk about, but it's like the flavor of of timing and everything they had. But huh. I don't know if I could probably try to get an example. Maybe Flop Your Mule is a good one. I but I wouldn't know how to like play it not that way. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Um, I could, and a bit of it is also dependent on who you're playing with to make the drives. Yeah, uh, but I, I guess like, I don't want to just play Flop Your Mule bad and, and be like, this is how other people <laughs> say it or whatever. But, I mean, I, I, I think this is a good example of the kind of like bounce and, and, and like timing I'm talking about. It's like... Just, I don't know. Right. It's, it's kind of distinct from maybe the, the groove that like a, a bluegrass band from the 80s or, or something would have had. Nothing wrong with, with any of that kind of music or anything. I really enjoy all, listening to all of it, but it's just a, I, I kind of overexpose myself to, to that flavor of, of bluegrass just so I can learn to emulate it. 
you know. Yeah, sometimes you you do have to dive all yeah. the way in just yeah. to <laughs> when you when you come out of it, it corrects itself back to like just the yeah. right amount. <laughs> no, I think there's something to be said about the, it has like a certain swinginess to it and I don't mm-hmm. mean swing as in like the da ba da ba da yeah da, no, I, but that, like that's, the, a, that's a good description that aggressive rhythm it's, to it it's it's definitely like an like, even like an attitude kind of thing right. with with the music it's 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 a weird concept but it's like you can you can definitely pick it out when something is that way and then when something isn't and, totally. it, and it totally is like a band thing too as well so. right right I, I love asking people and and if you have a way of demonstrating this, that would be cool too. What do you view as the main differences between, you said you went from like being heavy into Earl mm-hmm. to maybe being more this Reno influenced yeah. player. What, what do you think are like the hallmarks of uh, yeah. what makes those it's, styles it's actually, distinctive? It's, it's like backward. My brain is like backwards now because it is difficult for me to play Scrug stuff now. Mm-hmm. It's just not how I naturally think about things. It's I, I kind of did that to myself, I guess, but <laughs> I don't know. Like, I can try to play something like Earl's Breakdown, which is the roles. Is the biggest thing for me is Earl was just like very fluid with changing his right hand and okay. then doing really, I don't want to say simple, but just like, you know, simple like left hand stuff hmm. to, to kind of accentuate the melody in that way. So I guess uh, something like, like Lonesome Road Blues, I'll, I'll play that. Try to play that both ways, I guess. But like, I guess that was more of a. Like, it's really hard for me to get into the Scruggs roles I bet. now. I bet. Uh, kind of Scruggs thing. Yeah. Don Reno had this. He really heavily did a lot of forward roles uh-huh. and like. In a way, that's a simple right hand, but in another way, it's complicated because you're just doing this three-note pattern, which is like an odd number over and over and over yeah. over, like this four-four timing. Yeah, so the kind accent is changing. So, oh, yeah. and he would just he would do weird stuff with his left hand to kind of compensate for the fact that he's he's just doing a forward roll mm-hmm. the whole time, and then also just like where you place your index and middle fingers, like on like on what strings, would be constantly changing too. Hmm. And so it's like not just like. But you know, like something like that. Okay, so where yeah. Earl would have probably put like a Foggy Mountain roll in yeah. right at that mm-hmm. point, that didn't happen just now for yeah. for your yeah, it's, Reno it's, demonstration. He had a, he had a good like forward roll, which to me is kind of the a perfect way to play banjo for that. Like time, like uh-huh. feel that I was talking about earlier, like the way that that fifties bluegrass, like earlier bluegrass, just kind of pushed along. Yeah, I feel like it's really good for that. It's actually hard for me to play forward roll stuff like that with things that don't have that rhythm because I feel like I would I'm pushing, like it's, oh. it's more it's more of a pushing like like rhythm. if you sit in with whatever just mm-hmm. some some yeah, regular I have, I have to kind regular of band change it up a little bit. Interesting. Um, and not do that as much because it's I, 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 probably to other people's ears would be pushing, you know, by doing mm-hmm. that. But uh, it's it's all just how people are feeling it, I guess. Another obvious difference that that just screams Reno whenever you hear it are all his like strummed double stop yeah. type type of things. And, I, and you know, I, I heard you do quite a bit of it in your <laughs> set. Maybe talk a little bit about how how you a- approach playing playing that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, it's. I think Don probably picked that up because of of how much he was playing lead guitar. Like when he mm. came, I think when he came back from World War II, he was like, he was just a guitar player for four years until he got in '49, joined up with Bill Monroe. Okay. So that's probably where a lot of that comes from. But it's, that's that's kind of how I think about it too. But it's a, it's really good to. Like before I learned any of that stuff, I always had this problem. It's just like, how do I play slower or like medium tempo swingier stuff on the banjo? It yeah. was like kind of lost on me. Uh-huh. And that was a good in, because like once I learned to do that, you know, like that kickoff to I Know You're Married or, yeah. or something is like playing something at about that tempo is uh, is hard to do with just rolls, you know, but I think you have it in rolls because even though it's slow, it's like it doesn't feel like it actually 
gets up and, and moves. It's hard you know. to get just the right time into it. Or something, you know, it's kind of... It's, but with, with that, you have much more control over, you know, the, the power and, and, like, swing that you're given the song. Yeah. Like, something like that. Yeah. That is something that I have not done much of. To the extent that I do double stops, I probably do the do that with yeah. my uh, index and middle fingers. Mm-hmm. But talk about the challenges and how you've come to get used to doing that strumming with your thumb pick. And, and a lot of people listening, maybe maybe they don't realize it, but a lot of those strums that you're doing, those are just thumb pick downstrokes yeah, hitting all, all those. All, all downstrokes with the thumb. It's almost pretty, like a Chuck much. Berry type of approach. Yeah. To me, doing something like that that fast, as far as the double stops go, would yeah. be the easiest way to do it, Would I think, would be with the thumb. The way that I learned to do it is I kind of change up my hand position a little bit, makes it easier, instead of just having that... If Because if you cr- try to do it with this kind of like anchored, standard... like Yeah, thing, like, like a like traditional you bluegrass. Can't, you can't really get after it yeah. that same way kind of awkward yeah but so i just like comes off kind of harsh to unanchor the fingers and then I, I, you can also put your palm kind of on the bridge like that okay um and then maybe put the fingers here yeah and it gives you a better position to do that and then you can also push down on the palm more if you want more of a muted okay like kind of thing that's really cool but. Yeah, I, th- I think whenever I've tried it, and I probably just haven't put enough hours into it, it's it's very uneven, it sounds really harsh, mm-hmm. and it's definitely tough to play like in the context of seamlessly using that and then coming out of it to play something else. But yeah, so like in, in something like Charlotte Breakdown, like yeah. what I, this morning, it's like, that's a quick song. But he kind of uses it as like a halftime thing. So. There, you know. Yeah. But yeah, like that that's the thing where you'd be going into that style. Like a... Uh, uh, and go back into rolls. There. It's, yeah. It's, so it's something to get used to changing the hand positions. And Don, that was, that was, I feel like that's something Don, even more so than just that like binary like this hand position this hand position right he would do stuff like that a lot and just kind of fluidly change his hand position and that's something i've tried to adopt you know because there's a difference like like in how i was playing floppy mule earlier there's a difference to if i just stay still with my right hand completely and like then like i feel like he might get a little looser with it I mean, I've no, I've, I've never, I, I can't like see him doing this, but like, this is kind of how I think about it. But it's like a kind of getting a little bit looser with your right hand when you want more of like a bounce, or just kind of. I don't, I've never thought about it this way, but I guess a, a way of explaining it is like emulating the feel of whatever song you're doing with however your hand is being placed. I guess. Like, like move your right hand with the rhythm Some, a bit. Sometimes, if, huh. if that's what it like with that, because I usually play that really bouncy or something. So I'll like. Like I'll do like a lift up there. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's weird, subtle stuff like that that I feel like made Don's playing really interesting to me. I haven't um, watched as much of Don's playing, but I, I definitely speaking for Earl, he lifts his hands up all mm-hmm. the time oh, when there's he, little bouncy, especially sections. on those like kind of stuff. Yeah, that was that's more right. of like Earl. There's also this one recording of of Don playing Whoa Mule and like you know there's that just normal like thing on Woe Mule, but right. he does all this weird, like, finger, finger strumming kind of stuff to, to, to get that... Don does? Yeah, like, like a... Which is like, it sounds weird, but it's, it's, it's we- hard to emulate the way he does that, because it's yeah. just like, it's... <laughs> I don't know, but he, he had a lot of stuff like that, and, and that's obviously a different hand 
position as well, just like. Yeah, you know, that's really so. cool. And I guess maybe something else that he did that was kind of like that is muting the fifth string and then like, and also bouncing the hand like, like a. <laughs> that almost or, gives it like a little bit closer to a claw hammer sound. Yeah, and I feel like there's other stuff too that he would do to kind of emulate whatever feeling. Because that, that's something that I feel like banjo players who don't wear finger picks, that's a freedom that they have of kind of like they can go into claw hammer and then out of claw hammer and then yeah. kind of switch up. And maybe that's what Don was going, like wanted that kind of freedom as well just by doing weird and hand, work hand around stuff. yeah, yeah. Um, and that's actually uh, snuffy jenkins who you know don learned from could play claw hammer with picks on but he would use his ring finger like okay. it, I, I can't do that but it's like it, he would pull, brush down with his ring finger and leave his thumb pick on and like do that kind wow. of thing, okay which i've, I've I'm not going to ever be able to do it. You can maybe try <laughs> yeah. to use the tip of your thumb somehow, yeah, I guess. I, I, but. I don't know if he would do that or even just, just pick it with the... Yeah. And I, I, there's a video of, of Snuffy Jenkins doing that on YouTube. I think, Is there? I, I think it's he's very old at the time. It's from like the 80s. Okay. Um, but he was talking about doing that on one one song that they did like back in the 40s or 50s or huh. something. I don't think there's a recording of, of I've never. That it's never even occurred to me to try to YouTube Snuffy Jenkins films because oh, I, I just assume that there's not. He a, lived a long time. He, he lived longer than Don Reedlow. Like he, he was uh -huh. around in the, there's like, it's weird to listen to these because there's like modern radios with like modern ads and intros and this is like, and now Snuffy Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, it's 1993. It's like a time machine <laughs> yeah. happened or something. Um, and yeah, even, even like just old, not even people that are that old, but older people in their forties or fifties, I, I know would would you know hang out with Snuffy. Jenkins Actually, remember and, him, and yeah, stuff. and like he was just like, wow. oh yeah, he was a weird guy, <laughs> kind, of, <laughs> kind of stuff. That's funny, but yeah, he's which is so weird to have a figure like him. Wade Wade Maynard was another one who lived uh, until fairly recently. I, like one hundred three, I think. He's he's from, from up close to me. I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm up in Michigan, so yeah, I have. Uh, but I, I, ne I never got to meet anybody like that. I bought my first banjo in like 2013 or so. Huh. So I think in 2012, is, it seems like when a lot of people have passed away <laughs> that were like really oh, really? Like, that's when Earl Scruggs, but I think that's when Wade Maynard passed away and then stuff like that. But it's, it's interesting to have figures like that that are just like pre-bluegrass figures kind of just around. It you makes know. you, the, the fact that they have, have passed and, and you know they were with us until they weren't it, uh -huh. it kind of makes you try to appreciate the people who would maybe be in that category yeah right now i mean we're sitting here at dell fest and yeah dell is getting up there in age he won't be around forever so yeah i just try to en enjoy any chance yeah, I, I, I have to see I, him I or even people too. like sam bush or someone like that yeah um and and oft oftentimes it's like I, it, it just seems like a disconnected era in a way, like it's like an era that just, we're just not a part of. Right. But then, like, I'll learn that someone was alive because of the news of their passing or something, and that's that's always strange too. But yeah, yeah, and it's it's only after the era is done that you realize that you were in it. Yeah, uh, yeah. To exactly. begin with, that's kind of funny. I was like, oh, I didn't realize like I could have potentially met this person that who just passed away. Yeah, huh. isn't that funny? Yeah, it's like yeah, deep thoughts with, with Trevor Holder. <laughs> Folks, we are in a golden age of online instrument instruction, and at the top of that world is Peghead Nation. Peghead Nation has streaming video courses in banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, dobro, upright bass, and ukulele, so you can learn bluegrass, old time, and plenty of other styles from some of the most talented players and instructors in all of Roots music. Check out the courses they have and this is just for banjo you could get beginning or bluegrass banjo with bill evans clawhammer banjo with evie laden wade ward style banjo with bruce molsky 
the banjo according to Danny Barnes, and contemporary bluegrass banjo with Wes Corbett. Each of those courses include high-quality video lessons, downloadable notation and tab, play-along tracks, and plenty of tunes and songs to play. And the best thing yet is you're going to get your first month free just by being a listener of this show. So go to pegheadnation.com and use promo code PICKYFINGERS at checkout and claim your free month of the best instruction out there. And if you find yourself needing a banjo or accessories to get ready for those Peghead Nation courses, I highly recommend you check out Elderly Instruments, which is the world's most trusted source of new used and vintage stringed instruments, including banjos, guitars, violins, mandolins, ukuleles, all that stuff. They're going to have the best instruments you can find anywhere. And we're talking everything from the more affordable instruments for people starting out on up through the most highly sought after vintage instruments. Elderly Instruments has been family owned since 1972. And if you can't make it to their Lansing, Michigan showroom, you can see their full selection at elderly.com or give them a call at 517-372-7880 for some professional advice on all of your banjo and other stringed instrument needs. And you know what all these stringed instruments have in common? they all sound better with GHS Strings. GHS Strings is another sponsor of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast, and I'm proud to say they have been made in Battle Creek, Michigan since 1974. And if you don't want to take my word for it, maybe you'll believe such people as J.D. Crow, Sonny Osborne, and Bela Fleck, just a few of the many, many users of GHS Strings. So go check them out, ghsstrings.com. They have a wide selection of gauged sets so that no matter what you're looking for, you'll be able to find something there. So speaking of, you know, you're talking about hand positions. um, I I noticed another aspect of your banjo mechanics is you hold it really high. Very, (laughs) very Don Reno-esque. Was that, was that an imitation thing at first or, uh, Uh, does that actually work better for playing that technique? That's, that's how I find it comfortable, but also I I would play in a, in a few groups and stuff when I was younger, especially that would play around one microphone Mm -hmm. and that's like, Oh, and I'm I'm not that tall either. So (laughs) like getting into a single microphone, that's like, maybe even like slightly above my head or something. <laughs> the band just got to be. That's like, a really good point. <laughs> Which I think might've been why they were doing it too. Cause they like back then you didn't have like this, like this modern setup of having like mm-hmm. every instrument being mic'd and like having 10 mic, like if it's a five piece band where everyone sings, it's like 10 microphones or something right. on stage. I also think that that's probably the fact that they couldn't be amplified in that kind of way probably drives a little bit of the style of of music they were playing too. And now that we're talking through it, I wonder if it also has to do with the fact that they didn't have stage monitors. I wonder if it made it easier for him to just hear himself too. Yeah. Um, And that's the same kind of thing is like when you have one microphone like that, you probably shouldn't be using stage monitors anyway because it'll just feed back off. So that's another thing is when I'm doing like in a band like that, yeah, having it there, I can kind of just do that and then like <laughs> twist my head a little bit and kind of hear myself pretty well. Yeah, right on. So let's go back to what was the next step for you in terms of like maybe developing into a, a person who was playing in bands and playing professionally? Yeah, because I kind of just went to fiddlers conventions. I enjoyed doing contests and stuff like that because it was a good thing to work towards. Yeah. It was like a good performance opportunity, which I... And I, I kind of forced myself to do that, not specifically out of like a like a drive to perform, but more just like as as something to make me better, I guess. Mm-hmm. Then you know, just meeting people there, meeting people who are interested in, in the same kind of stuff as, as you are. Yeah. So I, I started going to more and more festivals like that. Um, are there a lot of those nearby where you were growing th- up? There was some good like bluegrass and old time fiddlers conventions in. Uh, like the middle Tennessee area, it's mm-hmm. like an hour north of, of Chattanooga. So that I, I mostly went to those and then started, like when I turned 16 and could drive, I would go farther and far, like as, as much as my parents would, would let <laughs> yeah. me. Like, it's like, can I go to this? It's six hours away <laughs> right. or something. But uh, kept pushing the boundary a bit. Yeah. And then being able to do that, I was, you know, kind of cast a wide net on all the people that I was able to meet, which was 
really wonderful for me to be able to do that at, at a young age. And um, I remember meeting, you know, like people who, you know, I was like, man, like what they're doing, like I, I want to be just like that or something, you know. Can you yeah. can you think of any, are these yeah. players, no, known players? Or yeah, just, yeah, I uh, mean, uh, uh, the first time that happened to me, I say, was, was at like the Smithville Fiddler's Convention, which was the first Fiddler's Convention I went to. Yeah, that, that, that's when I got introduced to Don Reno. But then also, um, there was another guy there who was a really good Don Reno style banjo player, is Kurt Stevenson. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. And Jeremy Stevens wasn't there at that time, but like I saw that and I was like, whoa, I should really look into <laughs> all the Don Reno stuff. So I, I went home, you know, and started studying a bunch of Don Reno because of that. And then due to that, you know, like I, I would, I kept meeting people like. Jeremy Stevens um, was was another one that I met like after I'd learned a little bit of the stuff and he definitely uh -huh. really helped me along by sending me so many recordings that are not easy to find oh, wow. and and just I, I don't know just like giving me advice and telling me how Don maybe was doing some certain things and that was I think I was like 14 or 15 when I met him and he just kind of dumped all this information on me That's really cool. Really wonderful and even even now if if I like if there's something that I think there's a recording of or, or like have a question about that, I'll just send him a message and, and be like, it's, do you have a recording of this? And he's like, oh, yeah, I've, I've got a recording of someone doing that. <laughs> and he'll just send it my way. He, but, he seems to be very like um, completist in yeah. his, his interest of, of uh, all sorts of old records yeah. and, and old folk music. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that he'd be the guy to Yeah, he's, to, he's, to he's, he's great to to know if to, when you're interested in stuff like that too, because it's like, I'll never have that like much of a complete, just like, you know, knowledge of, of, yeah. of 78s or, or, or like old live recordings that, that he has, but he's, he's definitely good. Cause I, I remember there was this one, like, like classic, even like classic banjo technique that hmm. um, I had never heard anyone do on recording. And like, there's not too many people doing that. So I'd, I've never heard anyone do it in person either. And it was just described in books. And I was like, do you have a recording of anyone doing that? And he's like, oh, yeah. Like, I'll just send it to you. Crazy. <laughs> and, and that's just some, like, cylinder recording from, like, the 1910s or, or whatever. He's that's like, yeah, crazy. Yeah, i got a recording of that. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm the guy who has a banjo podcast, which is already super niche. Yeah. <laughs> and you're saying there's, like... A smaller niche of you, like Reno followers, that <laughs> you have a secret handshake and you can, <laughs> yeah, like this uh, old, like old music and like old recordings in general is kind of, I guess, like a um, a, a thing that when you're into it, there's there's a lot to like dig through there, and, oh, it's, yeah. and it all is like has historic value too. So it's all kind of interesting to just reel through and listen to and like. It's it's cool to hear you know like live shows of a bluegrass band in the fifties because it it is like pretty different from just listening to their studio recordings like like anything is like seeing a band live is. I mean, I referred uh, jokingly to uh, Snuffy Jenkins being in a time machine, but yeah, yeah, those old recordings really are in a lot of ways like having a time machine. You get to hear how the crowd sounds, how the band sounds. Absolutely, and, like like yeah. recordings from the Opry from the '40s, like when Amazing. Bill Monroe and Earl Scruggs were first right. like playing the Opry together. It, I don't know, stuff like that is really wonderful to have. And someone like Jeremy is, you know, has a really great catalog of all of that. Yeah, what a great resource. Yeah. So we've gone down the the Reno road, so to speak, but you've also kind of alluded to the fact that you were into some other like obscure yeah. playing styles. Tell us, I don't know, tell, tell me about a few of those. Yeah, um, as far as bluegrass goes, there's probably not anything more, uh, I guess, sur surprising or like than like as far as traditional bluegrass banjo playing goes than Don Reno's playing. But I mean, I'm still into like more when you get into old time music. And, and like older country music from like the 20s or 30s, that's when the banjo playing get different because like Earl Scruggs wasn't around yet. Mm -hmm. And Earl Scruggs really, you know, made this way of playing the banjo popular. Sure. But before that, it's just like right hand techniques and, and like whatever people were doing, there was just like absolutely no standard, I guess, to, which is a good thing in my opinion. Well, because right. people were just doing whatever they were They were figuring like it out themselves, yeah. Um, and so one thing... One player that sticks out to me that I've, I feel like I've gotten a lot from is, is Uncle Dave Macon, because he just he has like a huge 
catalog of recordings from when he first started in like the early 20s to like pretty much when he died in, uh-huh. in, in the early 50s. And what a lot of people know Uncle Dave for is like what he did on the Opry when he was older. <laughs> Yeah, like what there's live recordings of He's spinning his banjo around, doing, and doing that, or just like <laughs> playing like claw hammer uh, and comedy stuff or whatever. But yeah. uh, man, he had like a really intricate, like three finger style huh. when he was younger, and like his first recordings, he was he was 55 years old. So yeah, like the, his first recordings are nearly all like there's like one or two claw hammer pieces out of like 20 on a session that he would do and they're all like this three finger style um let me th- see if i can think of something to, that would be good to demonstrate yeah that. for a good like i guess like demonstration of like the, the intricate side of, of uncle dave's style he had one i think of all his studio recordings he had one released completely instrumental recording hmm. it was called uncle dave's beloved solo and it starts. He, I, I can't really do the beginning of it. Uncle I've Dave's learned. beloved so, solo. Yeah, it's just what the record's great... <laughs> called. I don't know what tune he's playing. It, it's like some kind of parlor Spanish fandango kind of uh, tune that yeah. old time banjo players might have played back then. But he starts by playing like Rock of Ages. I can't really but like this strum like or, or something. I, I can't remember how that goes. But once he gets into the, the other part of it. It's been a while since I've <laughs> tried this one. Very cool. And he kind of went r- around and round on that, playing it different, like every time. He was a really talented banjo player, just doing stuff like that. And as far as you know, was he playing with the same sort of a- approach that you're using, like a resonator I, banjo with bare fingers? Um, sometimes uh, metal strings. Yeah, I think so. Um, and sometimes he would play an open back. But I, it, banjo players, like old, older banjo players like that, I think would not shy away from using resonator banjos. Like maybe some old time players would right. if, if they were like purely claw hammer or something. But yeah, and I've even seen pictures of him, of him having a very like bluegrass looking like anchoring, like huh. a three finger thing. Interesting. Yeah. So he's no finger picks though, is the, that's one of the things, you know, that there wasn't too many people using finger picks on the banjo at that point in time. Hmm. But yeah, so he had, like that's that's his end, but he would constantly like like uh, like that or something. Oh know? wow! It's a uh, it's so really more of cool. a strum style for the accompaniment. But yeah, like to... I, there's a video of him kind of doing it like that, but it's 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 from a I think it's from a movie, so he's not actually playing, so he could just be. Do yeah, <laughs> hamming it up or, or something yeah. like that. That's this, cool. Th- that's actually funny. Uh, Don Reno does that on the Kroger show. Uh-huh. Some of the Kroger show, I think, is live, but there's some of the Kroger show. And it, I think there's two episodes of the Kroger show are on YouTube. You can just go look um, because I think those are the only two I've ever seen. I think they might be the only two like surviving reels of that. Okay. But it was a Don Reno Red Smiley uh playing kind of like the Martha White show but for Kroger <laughs> yeah I have a um, DVD that someone gave me of one and I I think they're playing live but you're saying yeah, there's one where they're miming it I, there's one with the where the Stanley brothers are guests and they uh and Don is like playing something they pre-recorded it because they're like in a like in a church or something and, okay and he pre-recorded it and he's like definitely in the recording has a capo on but like in the like in the video he's just like making these weird like close position <laughs> chords like which is a thing that he would do sometimes i guess but <laughs> it's like you're not it's obviously that. <laughs> not what's, what's actually happening yeah, and i funny. wonder if he did that like on purpose just be like this is kind of funny <laughs> if you watch a lot of those old like rock and roll shows from the 60s that's like yeah. a lot of those bands they would embrace the fact that they could act really silly miming and yeah, yeah play all these weird looking things yeah there's just one, he, he might have been a bit of that i can't remember what band it is it's, it's like Nirvana or something was like playing a show where 
they uh, they were told they had to play to like a backing track of themselves playing, uh-huh. and like the, only the <laughs> vocals could be live. And so they're just like not even playing; they're just like right. doing this and like swinging their instruments around. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of funny yeah. to watch. Yeah, it just seems so goofy. Might as well <laughs> go all the way with the yeah. goofiness. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Um, so how did, I mean, your current band, I, I assume your your main gig for the last, I don't know how long, is uh, with the Price Sisters now, right? Yeah, it's, it's actually, my first show with them was Del Fest Light last year. Oh, no so kidding. So it's been about exactly a year now. Oh, that's cool. Um, but yeah, um, I, I got in with them uh, that when they needed a banjo player, Connor Velistra, the guitar player. Mm-hmm. I, me and him are really good friends and have been really good friends for a few years now. So we were constantly hanging out and... You know, because he's he's another person who's super into the older music, right, and, and right. like he was one of the only people who would like sit down and play Uncle Dave tunes with me or something <laughs> like that. So we would just like he would come over to, my, and he's also from Chattanooga, so we would just come over to my house. We'd sit down and do that for hours and hours. Oh, that's cool. Just kind of built that up, and almost like never played bluegrass with each other for for a while. Now we just we we play a ton of music together, and you know we're with the Price Sisters, and we do a few other things like this year. Uh, we're playing with this this fiddler Billy Hurt, his hmm. his band Five Mile Mountain Road. We're we're filling in with them on like nearly all their shows this year, and then we also um, we like to go out and do stuff. The two of us like a duo. Me oh, and that's Connor. cool. And then we we just recorded in December like a like a album of the two of us, and then also some other musicians to like fill out a band when we wanted hmm. a band. And I was I'm hoping that should we should have that out as as soon as we can. We're supposed to be getting the masters pretty soon. Oh, that's that. cool. But yeah, we, we try to do as much stuff like that. Cause he's definitely someone who's, he's like one of those people you meet and it's like, Oh, we're just, we like all of the same brothers things, from you know? different mothers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even just being like growing up in the Chattanooga area I and mean, we didn't meet each other until we had both moved away from Chattanooga. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of strange. But we like, we both know the same people from back home and would go to like the same jams and, and it seems that, impossible that you wouldn't have run into him. I know. Like, we talk about going to like this same like Wednesday night jam that's like like it, the same years and knowing the same people from that. And, and I don't know. It's just like we weren't supposed to meet then. I guess. Yeah. Well, but, I'm glad it happened eventually. You guys yeah. got to stick together. Yeah. That's that's how I got it. Got started with the Price Sisters. Was he was already playing guitar with them and so when they needed a banjo player it was kind of natural for him to just be like oh trevor (laughs) i mean you you can talk more about it if you want but from from me watching their presentation and now knowing more about your playing Mm -hmm. and your interests it seems like such a perfect fit for the you know just the style and aesthetic that you go for with your playing yeah definitely I've, i've enjoyed playing with them and and last year it was kind of a weird year to be playing out of at course because it was kind of getting back out after COVID. But I, I had a really good time and I'm really looking forward. We have some, we have, you know, this going mm-hmm. on and then some bigger festivals later this summer as well, which I've, I'm really busy um, between that. And I also, I also work full time. So it's like, Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is every weekend from now until like October or something is kind of booked, but I'm, so your vacation days are just more work. My vacation days are, are, just going out to festivals, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how it was last year, too. But, I, I mean, I probably couldn't do both of those things for a long time. But for right now, I'm, I'm young enough to where I, I don't need to take, like, restful vacations. You don't need to sleep. <laughs> no. You don't need to eat no. or, like, do healthy things. Just, no. you know, <laughs> play, yeah. go play your band. Uh, anything else to add? I, um, you know, you, you went through the Uncle Dave stuff, but but you had mentioned, like, other old-timey obscure styles like was yeah. there something i don't even know how to ask about that because i'm not too familiar but um other stuff one thing that i've been getting into recently uh, it, maybe the last few couple of years is um banjo players from georgia and like that kind of style because like back then like the regional even now i guess you know regional styles are definitely like a real like palpable thing mm-hmm. you know, like String bands from Georgia sound a certain way, and like string bands from North Carolina sound a certain way. Yeah, and like string bands from Georgia being like the Skillet Liquors. (laughs) 
for the George Yellowhammers, uh, like John Dillashaw's, like Seven Foot Dilly kind of. There, I feel like there's like this pervasive style of, of, of banjo playing, like that they were all kind of do had their own take on, and that, that's one that's one of the things that's that I, I don't hear a lot either. Um, and it's it's really fun to go back and like decode some of the stuff from the '78s, the, the, but um, like Fate Norse or or Gid Tanner would sometimes play the banjo with the skillet liquors, okay, and like Bud Landris with the Georgie Yellowhammers. But it's like they had this like two finger style of that's like not up picking or claw hammer, but it's like a th- this, I guess, this, I can't really definitively say any of this because it's just what I hear, but I, I think I've gotten somewhat close to, okay. to what they're doing. <laughs> can't like t- speak with authority on this because I'm just like some guy who's listening to him being like, yeah, I think, I think that's it. But uh, it's so like that kind of right hand thing. And that's really good. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, like, uh, like, I would hear that and have no clue what was going on because because uh-huh. I'm like you can tell there's an interesting rhythm going on, and you're, I would try like claw hammer to emulate it and I couldn't and I try other stuff and I I kind of landed there was like one recording I can't remember what it was but where like the banjo was very prominent and I could kind of listen to it and there's some solo recordings of Gid Tanner playing the banjo which are super helpful learning that. But you think that's actually a, a somewhat of a common mm-hmm. thing that a lot of the Georgia once, once players you hear have. it, you hear that rhythm everywhere, and it's really good specifically for like the band feel that like a band like the Skillet Liquors or, or those string bands from Georgia had. It's like the, a Georgia rhythm kind of thing right. that they had. So like doing that, you can kind of do this kind of slidey um, like. A, and actually, real quick, before you do another mm-hmm. demonstration, we sh- I should do a better job of describing what you're yeah, actually doing. Um, it's sort of a claw hammery thing. You're strumming it with the, the with back the, nail of your the index, index finger, but then the index is also doing a few up up strokes mm-hmm. with like more the more flashy part. Yeah, so it's like up and down. It's it's um yeah up and down with the index finger and hitting the thumb down on whatever string. Because it, uh, it, it's it doesn't feel like drop uh, cl- drop thumb claw hammer mm-hmm. because that that feels like you're really like pushing your thumb down. It kind of just feels like you know a normal thumb position for like even like bluegrass or, or whatever. Yeah. Then, then you're just like doing that with your finger. Uh-huh. So yeah, so like you could you kind of switch up the rhythm of it however you feel you know. Kind of like you would be playing rhythm guitar or yeah. something. And then, like when you're playing more lead kind of stuff, like you can kind of just do a two finger, okay. whatever you'd normally do. Um, like, uh, very yeah, cool. Something like that. I think that's what they're doing. <laughs> but that's really good for like. Skillet Liquor's rhythm stuff because it, it when you do it you kind you kind of naturally get that that drive that they had mm-hmm. um, and it's also good for like these slidey stuff that I feel like I don't keep, maybe don't hear like five string banjo players do it all too much but in those Georgia bands they'd sometimes have banjo mandolins that would be like sliding oh, yeah. sliding up and just doing these weird like not really landing on a note kind of thing yeah <laughs> but you can like like uh, like. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's just more of a. I mean, yeah. the fact that they played it on banjo mando, it almost makes me think more of like a Monroe style of mandolin playing. Yeah, but yeah, that, that's a whole other banjo. thing. Is there's there's tons of really cool mandolin playing from that era too. That's very intricate and pre bluegrass, not bluegrass pre Monroe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's for the mandolin podcast. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, not a uh, little out of my turf. <laughs> Anything else to say about your your playing in terms of like how you've worked up these Reno things? Like, are there certain exercises to get these single string passages, or anything um, else you'd recommend before we, you know, talk about other things? Yeah, for Reno stuff, I guess that was something that I, I was working on. You know, it's more distant to me, like 
the process of learning it, you mm -hmm. know, because it's probably one of the first things that I really got into. Yeah. But, you know, single string, um, that I, I'd say like getting the rolls straightened out is probably the most important thing to me for Reno style. Um, but also the, the single string, yeah, I mean, just learning. I'm not, I've n never like been into playing scales or anything because like, I don't find myself like using the hand positions that are usually required to play scales on the. I'm sure other people find, would find it incredibly useful, but like to play, I don't feel like I would ever play out of that kind of position. Yeah. So I I just don't really practice stuff like that. But I'll definitely practice like just. So just maybe learning some of these lines and then just getting them just doing them over and over like follow the leader that song is a good one because yeah. it's, you know, it's that lick <laughs> over. yeah it's like getting that it took me a really long time to feel comfortable doing anything like that and even now like after a certain speed threshold or whatever i'm just like no single string <laughs> <laughs> yeah and don we don reno might have been the same way but he I don't know, sometimes, every now and then, I'll hear a recording of them, and it's just like, dang, like, I, I could never, I've never been able to play single string that fast. You had an extra like coffee that. that day or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's also good, like, those single string passages, and the, it works really well with the brush stuff. It's like, they did a lot of, like, country two-step kind of rhythm songs, like, something like, I wouldn't change you if I could. So like, like, his break to that is pretty, like... Like the fiddle would come in, but going learning how to go between that and single string because, like, on his next pass, or, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's 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 really good for like that swingier country two right. step kind of thing. It's it's sort of that awkward range of tempos where. Yeah. You can't really like drive it with a forward roll mm -hmm. too well, but it's it's uh, a yeah. little a little too upbeat to just do yeah. prettier st sounding stuff. Yeah, yeah, and then when also like yeah, when it gets slow enough, you can just kind of do the right. And I feel like a lot of people are familiar with doing that, but that nice like pr probably like the same it's the same kind of rhythm that like a, a '50s country band like like Ray Price or, or, or like Webb Pierce kind of sound that they probably wanted to have that kind of rhythm in, yeah. you know, to their music as well. So then I guess that's Don's way of just getting into that. Yeah, you know? I think you're right. Um, well, that's but, cool. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go home and practice. That's what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm learning here. Uh, uh, let's, let's uh, get away from that. Let's talk about like your, your instrument and your, mm -hmm. your setup. What's this, uh, what's this banjo that you're playing? Uh, this is a conversion, a TB1. So a, a 1930 TB1 or something. Um, I don't know too much. I don't, I don't think too much about like banjo models and mm -hmm. like make and stuff like that. It more so just like what I'm doing to them to set them up. And I, I, I wouldn't even espouse to be like a good, good at setting up a banjo, but I think I've figured it out just for this one, <laughs> just for mine, you know. For, for what you want on that particular yeah, banjo. Yeah, like I, I'm maybe good at setting this banjo up, yeah. but not others. Um, but yeah, so for me, kind of like, not necessarily copying like a Don Reno banjo s tone specifically, mm -hmm. but more just like a general, like what was prevalent in recordings, maybe from the 50s, like some maybe something that Alan Shelton or would have appeared on or like Earl Scruggs, Don Stover, like in, in that early fifties range is what I like. And uh -huh. it's, it's hard to understand if I'm actually getting that dialed in sometimes, but it's like, I guess the, the head being a bit tighter than, than average. Hmm. Um, I, I, I can't tune. I've never been able to like hear a note out of that. Okay. So, and I heard, I've, I've heard that some band players back then would like just feel with their thumb. Yeah. That's pretty much what I do. Um, so, and you can just tell that it's it's a I, lot stiffer I, I can, than yeah. I, about how how stiff the head is. So if if it pushes in too far, too easy, 
then I guess it's too loose. And, <laughs> yeah. then, and if it's if it's just completely you know like rigid, yeah. then then it's probably too tight. But and you're just closer to the ladder there. Closer to to it being too tight. Yeah. Um, because I used to uh, really get hung up on like the subtle notes of the of the tone that my banjo was getting and like stuff like that's probably going to get drowned out when you're in a playing in a bluegrass band. So I've kind of now trying to go more for just like it's like could I hear that on on one of the records that I like or something and then I'm like yeah I could. yeah <laughs> and I'm like okay I'm I'm happy with that which is better because you can really. I'm sure a lot of banjo players have experienced um, like just driving themselves absolutely crazy, like trying to get their banjo to sound a specific way. I definitely that was like that for a little while, yeah. and that's uh, you, sometimes you just have to learn to be like. Sometimes it's cool to just not care about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good enough is yeah. good enough. Yeah, and like probably all of everyone's heroes, like you know, at, at a certain point, we're just like ah, whatever. Like I'm just gonna right. play the banjo. <laughs> Do you own an arch top banjo? No. Okay. Um, and I've played a few. I've I've never really wanted to get into like having an arch arch top or anything. I I would have one for like the the fun of of having one and like. But I don't have a lot of instruments. But it, like, I guess this is is very like a how I have mine set up now. It's very bright and arch top ish. Well, that you know? plus, I mean, you you keep citing. Uh, Shelton and Don yeah. Stover and and yeah. people and you, you have such a bright setup that I'm like man this this guy kind of <laughs> needs an arch top yeah sometimes I think it's like uh, setting up my flathead to maybe kind of sound like an arch top might be a good goal <laughs> yeah I think um, but our arch tops when I play them they, they I, I get the same kind of paranoid thing just because of how like when you're playing them they sound so thin I mm -hmm. guess and like I don't. It's not not to say that they sound bad or anything, but that makes me paranoid while I'm playing them, you know. And like you think I, you're not getting the full potential. Yeah, like that it, you like could just be? and and being not paranoid while you're playing is like a it's probably like just as important as anything else. I think you're right. Um, so like yeah, like constantly thinking that I'm sounding like a certain way that's bad would just mess with me. So I, I haven't really like never been like super comfortable like. I, I don't know. You just don't even yeah. want to go there, kind of. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to mess with <laughs> West, mess with my head in that way. <laughs> well, uh, talk about the rest of the the setup that you do, or what what your preferences yeah. are for like bridge and picks and I anything don't else. Know that you have. what kind of bridge this is, but I've had it for a really long time and I like it. Um, but it's I've kind of sanded it down a little bit to make it thinner. It looks really thin. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, yeah. I, I like Yet another brightening thin, uh, yeah. factor. Yeah, exactly. I, I like thi a thin bridge. It's it's kind of like yeah, all of these things like to make it brighter. Yeah. And then maybe one or two things to like reel it back in, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, so. Tail did, did you mention who made that neck? Uh, Frank Neat. Made oh, wonderful. Neck. Yeah. Um, and I just recently got the, that's probably not, productive for podcast purposes i got this white uh truss truss rod cover yeah nice <laughs> just it's recently a, it's uh it's not perloid it, but it, it's kind of like a yellowed yeah. i could claim that this was on accident and i'd like to say it was on accident because i never consciously made any of these decisions but like the flying eagle inlay and that truss rod cover it's like looks a lot like don reno's banjo now oh, excellent <laughs> so it's like it's, it's a very nice coincidence yeah. i guess yeah for sure Everything else, I really just kind of tweak until it sounds right to mm -hmm. me. I couldn't tell you, like, this way of having the tailpiece or, like, this kind of anything anything else. But I do just mess with it. And it, it'll, like, go in a direction that I like and maybe keep doing it. Uh -huh. or, you know, just, like... Or not, and then you yeah, back it back off. Yeah. Okay. So, and I feel like that kind of stuff changes, like, especially, like, tailpiece height or something, I will change it every now and then just because like maybe the banjo is starting to sound a certain way <laughs> and I want to maybe correct something that I'm hearing in it. Yeah. So I will change. A, let's, I did that right before I came here. Um, so uh, it's uh, like, like we just sit at home and like just mess with weird little stuff. After I'm done, I'm, I'm usually happy. <laughs> yeah. You're not going off of a textbook. It's, it's yeah, just getting yeah. it. To, to Which is why I feel like I probably couldn't set up other banjos very well. Because it's just it's kind of just this one that I've learned on and yeah. like learn like 
I don't know. This tailpiece is weird. Sometimes I'll have to like knock on it. Like <laughs> nothing is 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 academic to what I'm like doing to this banjo. Hey, you but, <laughs> you and the banjo have come to know each other. It sounds yeah, like so. Yeah, that, so that's, I, that's I can good. just do do whatever <laughs> with it. What about any other gear? Do you have like stage or recording microphones that you are? No, uh, I'd like are to, your favorites. I'd like to learn more about stuff like that. Just recently played a showcase at Spigma. Me, Connor, and the band we had to record with us. It was like a showcase, mm -hmm. big tone records showcase yeah. there. I they really do a lot of like rockabilly and stuff like that, don't they? Or am I uh, thinking yeah, of something different? Yeah, I, I guess some stuff like that and like blues and jazz. Okay. Uh, I think his, John, the, the owner there is like super into blues music, like early blues music. And, okay. and that's, that's kind of like what like what he's very familiar kind of like how i guess we would be with bluegrass you know okay. that, that's his thing that's his but you know he enjoys recording bluegrass bands and other things as well but he he had like old equipment that he brought and he he set up the sound for that showcase and in recent memory that was like the most satisfied i've been with a sound system because wow. it was just he was using that vintage stuff for mm -hmm. live and and like older microphones and and oh man and like we had uh it was me, Connor, on the guitar, we had a bass player, a fiddle player, um, and an electric guitar player. Mm -hmm. And he was playing through one of those amps as well. And it was just, w when you're going for that style of music and then actually having all of that equipment there, it's, it's like, it definitely adds adds an element. And I remember kicking into the, the first song that me and Connor were singing together. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, man, like, this is really cool <laughs> how this wow. is sounding right now. And that I think that made everyone in the band happier too just because it was oh, sounding I'm that sure. way and it made yeah. it you know that was that was a lot of fun i think i think he recorded it but i, I, haven't, I haven't heard the <laughs> i haven't heard it someday yeah cool uh anything else we should know about you or any way to like find you online and and follow what you're doing yeah i'm not very good at marketing my, myself <laughs> i have facebook and instagram and me and connor need to like probably put together some sort of social media for the stuff that we're doing because of just the amount of stuff that we're doing. Yeah. But neither of us are really that kind of um, person to to have a desire to market ourselves. I can relate. So we'll probably continue to, but we just, we did like me and Connor did the, the Floyd radio show on new year's day. Okay. And they, that I think comes along with like a small interview, like during the show mm -hmm. and that was, that was something they asked. So that was six months ago. And that was a question they asked is like, and we're like, oh yeah, we should probably set that up. And here you just, are again. Yeah, it's like six months later, you know, just, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll still. do it someday. Maybe when we actually are trying to release our, our records. <laughs> That'd be some good incentive, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but cool. That, that's another thing is, uh, I, this is probably my only means to market that <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Uh, we don't have a lot of stuff finalized for it, but we're hopefully we'll have it out by before the end of June. I hope so. Connor, the no. Connor project, yeah, whatever we're calling that. <laughs> I, I I can't defend it because I guess we've technically made no decisions, but uh, I guess we might call it uh, like like the album might be called like Chattanooga Dogs or something like that because okay. we, <laughs> it was kind of funny. We just learned that like that song Chattanooga Dog. Okay, we never did that song. We don't really listen to any recordings of it too often but we were just like oh it'd be kind of funny if our album was called chattanooga dogs because you know we're from chattanooga <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and then uh we just learned that song and recorded It's a weird way of, of wanting to name an album, just like learning a song for the. But I mean, I like I liked how the song turned out. Yeah, and everything, cool. So like, well, I'm looking forward to hearing it either yeah, way. So yeah, go go out and find it. There's no website, but you, you have look to look for it. You have to go to the 
Don Reno smoky back room society in order to gain access to to Trevor and he'll he'll give you a copy. Yeah, yeah. Him and Jeremy Stevens <laughs> will be in there talking about wax cylinders or something. Yeah, that's cool. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Trevor. It's been a pleasure meeting you and hearing you play and uh, and talking yeah. about banjo with you. Yeah, definitely. I was happy to be here. That's going to do it for this episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. The song clips you heard in this episode were Green Mountain Hop by Trevor Holder and Connor Vlietstra, Choking the Strings by Reno and Smiley, Old Dan Tucker by Uncle Dave Macon, Whistlin' Rufus by The Skillet Lickers, and Chattanooga Dog by Trevor Holder and Connor Vlietstra. Special thanks once again to today's Patreon supporter of the show, that's Brian Rosen head over to patreon.com slash banjo podcast to support the show yourself and come visit me over the next month or so. I'll be down at the IBMA conference. That's IBMA.org. And then teaching at the great lakes music camp. That's great lakes That's going to do it for me. I will see you all next time. <laughs>